Welcome, everybody, to the first episode of the PDs at Sea podcast, video cast, internet show. I don't know what we're going to call it exactly, but we're really glad to have you joining us um, here at what would be the, the first official podcast representing the Society for Education Anesthesia. Uh, Dr. Stahl, I'd like to introduce yourself. Sure, I'm David Stahl. I'm the Residency Program Director at The Ohio State University. Uh, I'm a practicing intensivist and obstetric anesthesiologist um, and have an interest in medical education. Well, there's a theme here because I'm also an obstetric anesthesiologist. Uh, my name is Brian Mahoney. I'm the Residency Program Director at the Mount Sinai West and Morningside um, Department of Anesthesiology here in New York City. So we're trying to represent both um, coastal elites and people in flyover country. Uh, I, I was thinking about the opportunity to do this show. In, you know, in years past, I've heard the phrase, that person has a face for radio. I think, unfortunately, I have a voice for silent movies. Um, but I'm going to do my best here uh, to make this fun and enjoyable. What are we doing here? Why are we spending our time doing this? Well, first of all, we want to showcase all the great things that the Society for Education and Anesthesiology does. For those of you who are visiting the Society for Education and Anesthesia webpage for the first time to watch this, or if you're listening to a podcast, you want to know more about it, SEA is, frankly, my favorite society in which I'm involved. And it's a society that's committed to uh, education in anesthesiology, as it says in its title. What does that mean? When we look at education innovation, try to provide a forum and uh, um, format for mentorship within academic anesthesiology. It's a really great place for young educators to learn more about education and find great mentorship. I'd like to promote technology, diversity, and well-being in anesthesiology education, and especially amongst leaders in anesthesia education. What's this podcast going to do? Well, I think the title says a little bit. It's a chance to hear from program directors uh, who are affiliated with Society for Education and Anesthesia. Uh, we want to focus on anesthesia education from the point of view of educators, specifically residency program directors, but not exclusively. We want to speak with leaders in anesthesia education about the broader issues that interface with training future anesthesiologists. So we're going to talk about things like recruiting, training, mentorship. I like the notion of professional identity formation. And we're going to look at the major forces that are impacting our profession and how that impacts training and mentorship in anesthesia education. You know, I think Brian and I really have the same philosophy of education, and that's really that education is a dialogue. And the best dialogues have different points of view. So just to use the C analogy here, we'll be going up and down and back and forth. Uh, our mission in this podcast is really to create a dialogue between anesthesiology learners and educators. Uh, and from that dialogue, to build connection and engagement with the future of anesthesia education. So I hope it's fun. I think it's going to be a blast. You know, one of the things that I realized was lacking um, was a chance for a dialogue between the educators and and those people who are looking to be in anesthesia or, or the learners. Uh, and I thought that a great resource that the SCA could provide is for people maybe who aren't as quite as involved in the broader discussion of anesthesia education or even people looking to get in anesthesia to hear what we're talking about. People applying to anesthesiology, what are program directors saying? Well, we're going to get them on the show and figure out what they're saying and what they're thinking. Um, so the topic for this first episode is, I think, the thing most people are thinking about right now. I'm guessing you're listening to this uh, in March of 2023, and we're all wrapping up the most recent interview season. And there were a lot of changes introduced to the process this year. What do you think about, was it more stressful? Was it better for you? What do you think, Dr. Stahl? I mean, I think... I think there were two big themes that emerged in my mind for for recruitment this year. The first is that anesthesiology, has especially, has become wildly competitive, and I think that is uh, that is a huge benefit to the future of the field. I think that it is also a huge challenge for applicants this year, and I think that that. Uh, bleeds into the second theme, which is anxiety. There was a ton of anxiety this year. There were all of these new things. There were signals. There was a supplemental application. Nobody knew what to do with these things. And uh, and as a learner, I am sure that the anxiety was higher on your end. But I can tell you, Brian and I were both anxious about how we were going to handle those things when we were thinking about recruiting for our programs. 
yeah, I wasn't ready for all the changes. Uh, I educated myself, but realized by the end of the season, uh, I'm going to have to revamp my approach next year. Um, signals. Uh, that's that's really a big topic. Just so you know, go, uh, in the rest of this episode, we're going to talk to some other educators. Uh, are we talking to someone they might have heard of, Dr. Stahl? Uh, you know, I think we are going to talk to the host of the ACRAD podcast, uh, Dr. Jed Wolfaw. I heard he has some inside information about the future of Signals, and we're also going to speak with uh, Dr. Carol Dyson, uh, who's the president-elect for SCA and also a recent program director. But I want to talk about the impact of Signals as it impacted me, uh, my perception, your perception. I think maybe we should talk about our home programs just a little bit to get a sense, to give a sense about where we're situated. Um, I'm in New York City, in Manhattan, on the uh, Upper West Side. Uh, there are five residency programs in Manhattan for anesthesiology, many, many more going across the five boroughs in the tri-state area. Uh, what's unique about my program is we're a little bit smaller. We're 15 residents per class as compared to the other anesthesiology residency programs in Manhattan. Um, so that's where I'm situated. It's probably a very different crowd that I'm attracting here um, compared to Ohio State University. You want to just briefly talk about your program um, so they know where you're coming from. Just FYI, listeners, in the future, if I feel as though uh, a guest is trying to um, advertise their program too much, I think I'm going to introduce a sound effect like a gong to tell them that they have been accused of trying to recruit or advertise. But I think it's important you know our context. Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm the program director, uh, as I said, at The Ohio State University. We're in Columbus, Ohio, in the center of the state. Um, as a native Californian, I never thought I would end up in central Ohio, but here we are. Um, there is only one other small program in Columbus, which has a metropolitan area of 3 million people. So um, we are in, in many ways the only show in town. There are obviously several other programs in the state of Ohio, but yes, we are in a very different setting. Um, you know, the hospital here has uh, has 1,500 beds and we are we are one program in, in the place. And, uh, and I think you're right, Columbus attracts a different crowd than New York City. Uh, when, when we looked at our signals for this year, I really didn't know what to expect. And we have actually some prelim data that's just come out from the AAMC looking at, at signals. Uh, and I think the problem is when you look at this data, they group all residency programs by specialty together. So it, you know, it is probably a different thing to signal a New York City program versus a Columbus, Ohio program. But when we look at it, the the uh, the limits of the 25th and 75th percentile are about programs got between 150, between 50 and 150 signals um, uh, on average for for programs. And so um, there were, you know, some programs who got up to close to 250, 300 signals, and programs who got as few as a handful based on this data. But I think that's interesting when you look at how many applications we had. I don't know about your program, right? We had. 2,104 applications this year for our, for our 16 categorical positions. That's interesting. And I, so I've been speaking with other program directors and I don't know exactly where to group my program. Um, like, I don't believe that the people who are applying to anesthesiology see my program uh, grouped along with say the Harvard programs or Penn. Um, however, I have seen trends that match with them speaking to their program directors about the volume of applications. Maybe it's a coastal thing. I had about what you had last year, Dr. Stahl, and this year I went down to about 1,800, and I had increased every single year, and I spoke to some other program directors in the Midwest and down South, and they all saw a significant increase in the number of applications, while I saw a mild decrease in other program directors in my region um, from, what, from people to whom I've spoken have had a mild decrease. I don't know if it's signals or if it's strategy, I and mean, what do you think is leading into that? I think that's really interesting. I, I do think signals are playing a role there. And I don't I don't know that we know the true impact because when you look at some of the programs like obstetrics and gynecology that have been doing signaling longer, they have a higher number of signals. And I actually think that's where we're headed in anesthesiology. And I think that will that will make the data a little bit more clear. When I've been talking to program directors, I've seen um kind of generally three strategies for how they used signals this year. And I'm curious kind of where you you fall in that. I think there are, there are some programs that said, if a person didn't, a candidate didn't signal us, we essentially didn't give their application much consideration there with maybe some few exceptions. There are programs that said, you know, we use signals, but we use them kind of in a, 
tiebreaker scenario. Like we were looking at everybody, but if they had signaled us, then we were probably more excited about them because they were probably more excited about us. And then there are programs I think that said, you know, we didn't get that many signals or we didn't really know what to do with it. And we kind of just set it to the side or looked at it as a, as an interesting fact. Um, we kind of fall into that middle group. I think we used it, we used it as a tiebreaker. We used it to, to move people up on the list. We didn't move it, use it to like bump people off our interview list, so to speak. Like if you didn't signal us, we, we didn't take that as a not interest. Um, but I'm curious, like, how did you, how did you guys approach it? Well, I, I think I'm kind of in this third category. Um, we got a large number of signals. In fact, we got as many signals as interview slots that we offer. Wow. Uh, you know, I spoke to uh, a program director from a program that everyone's heard of and said, if they didn't signal me, they didn't get an interview. And I can understand that, you know, yeah. you know, Stanford, you know, MGH, if you don't know about that program already, uh, if you didn't signal them, there's a reason you didn't signal them. Uh, I think my program is a little different. I actually approached some of my residents uh, who had come from outside of the metropolitan area and said, hey, this is the new system. Uh, what do you think you would have signaled our program if this was the system in place? Two in particular who I thought maybe wouldn't have known much about my program. They said, actually, no, I wouldn't have signaled the program. I heard about your program later in the season. And that made me very cautious about how aggressively to use the signals. Um, I think I'm going to continue to be somewhat cautious about it. So I probably got about half of my interview slots filled in the first you know, round of, of sending invites from people who signaled. And then I waited. I wanted to wait to see if there was buzz or I heard anything to, to allow other people to learn about my program. And I have to tell you, I've actually had people send me emails saying they tend to rank us number one who didn't send me a signal. So I, I feel like maybe that was the right move. But uh, you said something about the, the volume of signals, the number of signals going up. What do you think, I think I know what you're going to say, is the rationale for increasing the number of signals? So I think, I think the rationale is really um, to try to help programs really identify people who are interested in their program. You know, with, with the large number of applications that we're seeing, especially in the post-COVID kind of virtual interview world, it is really hard and the amount of work it takes, you know, for us to read an application, I would say for me to read an application when I'm well caffeinated takes me 10 minutes, uh, maybe eight if I'm really moving. So if I'm going to read 2000 applications, you just add up the number of minutes. It's like it is weeks to months worth of work. It's just not not tenable. And and um, I think the, the hope is that we can identify, hey, everyone who might want to come to your program has signaled your program so that you really can focus on that group. I, I, I worry about two things, though. I worry about one, like you said, somebody who didn't signal you up front because they didn't know about your program and then later or through the process has changed kind of what they're looking for, because I do think that happens. And then I also worry, you know, the signals were never intended to be um, markers of rank. They were just to be markers of uh, interest for an interview. And so I, I worry sometimes that they become this, gosh, if you didn't signal us, then we're not going to put you on the rank list in the same way. And I, I, I don't think that's the right move for us as a specialty, because I think that, that it, again, it limits that growth that can happen that a lot of people, I think, a lot of learners have during, during the interview season where they learn about programs and they learn about themselves and they realize, you know what, this is actually what I'm looking for in a program. Well, it's going to be tough. I've also heard uh, the hypothesis that if you if you have enough signals, let's say something between 15 and 20, then that would potentially serve as a an informal cap to the number of programs uh, to which each applicant can apply. You know, I think that we all get concerned that people are spending a lot of money, money, uh, yeah, because they're concerned about their their ability to match. And um, the AAMC has expressed a lot of reservation about providing caps. I think they're fairly firm that they don't want to cap the number of applications. I don't know exactly what's behind their motivation, but they say they want to provide the, the applicants to have all the opportunity they need. Uh, however, if we had 15 to 20 signals and, and the applicants heard that generally program directors were now ignoring people who weren't signaling given an ample number, then that would be somewhat of an artificial or, or informal cap. Uh, I think Dr. Walpaw might have more information on where that might go or people's points of view about that. But I've realized after the fact, um, I'm going to have to change my approach to how I give out interviews. Um, I don't think I'm going to increase, depending on how the signal system changes, um, my approach this year. Uh, but I think I'm going to wait a little bit longer. I think applicants got scared. I'll tell you what I did get. I got a lot more emails expressing interest very early in the season from people who had not signaled me. And it makes me wonder if those were as sincere as they had been in past years. What do you think? 
That's a great, that's a great point. I think it, it goes back to reflecting the underlying anxiety. You know, I think that not only uh, are we seeing, I think, number of, of applications per candidate up, I think that's reflective of anxiety. I think this year there was also the uncertainty of like, do I signal my home place or not? Do I, if I did a waiver rotation, do I signal that place? Like there is this, um, a little bit of a lack of clarity. And I think this year we will see that resolved. I think there are going to be some clear guidelines coming out, um, from the SAAA, the AACPD, um, that is the Society for Academic Anesthesia um, and the uh, uh, Association of uh, Anesthesiology Corps Program Directors, as well as from the AAMC that will clearly say for anesthesiology, we're all agreeing, do or don't signal your home program, do or don't signal your away program. So I think that hopefully having a more structured approach earlier in the season will help candidates allay some of that anxiety. But I similarly saw these like flurry of early emails. Like I'm really interested in your, pro I didn't signal you, but I'm really interested. Um, and, uh, I don't, I don't, I didn't know what to do with that as a program director. First of all, I will say if any of you emailed me and I didn't respond, it was not because I didn't like you or wasn't impressed with your email it was just a volume of emails a day issue. Um, but, um, but also, I think I think there was a I think it goes back. There was a ton of anxiety this year. I wondered, given the differences in our programs, how did you approach regional signals? Because that's that was a whole second layer of complexity here, right? So you, for those learners who maybe are pre-matched, like M ones, M twos, or earlier, this the signals we're talking about was to say like, I like your program. But then there was this second concept that you could list up to three regions out of the double AMC regions to signal or you could signal no preference for your region. Um, and what we saw on the program director side, which I didn't, I don't know if you knew this, Brian, go in it, but I didn't, is we either saw they signaled your region, you could see that, they signaled no preference for a region, or it was blank. So if it was blank, presumably they picked other regions and not yours, but you couldn't see the regions outside of yours that they signaled. You could like, cause I kind of was curious, well, what if they signaled like right next to mine? Maybe then that was kind of close enough. But but you only got those three three results. Wait, so I, I'm not clear on this. Are you saying that they could have selected something which was not provided to us? So if they had signaled, you know, the West Coast, it could potentially be blank on the application I'm looking at? Yes. So if they signaled three West Coast regions, it would look blank on your New York City application and mine, but a West Coast would see that they signaled their region. Also, if they signaled your region and two West Coast regions, on your on your view, you would see the New York City region, but you wouldn't see the West Coast regions, and I would see blank uh, because they did they didn't signal my region. So that's it. I I don't know how to feel about that. How did you guys? How did you look at regional signaling? I didn't. Well, you know, we didn't look at it too much. Uh, I felt reassured. I got to tell you something. Before this year, um, if you were from a California medical school, I generally didn't look at your application. Even a Californian who was doing medical school here, I would be a little bit loath to think they were as interested in my program. I mean, the weather- My California soul is so sad. The weather is so beautiful in California. I mean, I understand people just want to go back. My residents from California all just want to go back. I felt reassured when I saw a Californian and saw a New York uh, or mid-Atlantic signal. That being said, um, I did not know that uh, there was this kind of chicanery. Is that a good word going on? <laughs> so I, I don't. I didn't use it too heavily, and I'm glad I didn't because I didn't realize um, that was the case. Uh, so not very useful, I guess, in my opinion. What did you think about the other new aspect of the application, the supplemental app, the most meaningful experiences? I found it. I found it very challenging to use, um, to be honest, because you had on one hand in Eris, you have all of their experiences, and then you have this subsection where it had, you know, their top uh, impactful experience and then their five meaningful experiences. And so there was duplication between the two. Also, they didn't export for, for those who are not program directors. We don't often read all of our applications in the ERA system itself. Sometimes we export them as PDFs or read them in other systems. And so that data didn't export in the same way. It exported into a table that was very hard to link to the PDF. Um, the good news is all of that is going to get better this year. And in fact, there are going to be some changes to ERIS that um, condense the number of experiences that you will see and make them uh, all kind of in the same format. So this year, I think, was a giant experiment for ERIS. Uh, 
and I think that's okay. Like, I'm glad that they're trying new things and trying to get better uh, because I think our, our, you know, the future anesthesiologists uh, deserve that. But uh, I will find, I will say, I did not find it to be particularly helpful. The one area that I did find um, candidates were really heartfelt things in their impactful experiences. And that I felt like was um, really did give me some insight into, into who you were as a person. I really enjoyed that. Sometimes things that didn't necessarily make it into your personal statement, you were focusing on other things, but there was something really special that you wrote in there. I heard a lot of stories about, you know, really impactful COVID experiences or family experiences or, or growing up experiences. And I really did appreciate those, particularly then when I could meet someone and interview them and talk about it a little bit more. Um, I thought those were great. How well, about I you? Well, I think this is great. I completely disagree with you, which ah. is excellent, like perfect for a discussion. Not completely disagree. You know, when we're looking through applications, you probably feel the same way. Eris doesn't allow a, a applicant to, to really highlight, you know, you want to put that you did something and you want to maximally showcase that experience. So you, you list the experience, you have the bullet points or all the different aspects of what you did. And it's difficult when you're reviewing applications to say, okay, is, is this the thing that they were really into? Because this, this club they were part of or this research they did is occupying the same amount of space on the screen as that. So, you know, when I want to talk to someone in an interview, you want them to have the sense that, hey, I've tried to get to know you and I want to learn about you, but you don't want to waste your time talking about having them talk for 10 minutes about this experience that didn't mean much to them. So my previous strategy was uh, their personal statement. And when I'm guiding students about how to write their personal statement, I'll even say, hey, use this as a chance to kind of highlight or, or point to the things that you really are proud of and want, maybe want to talk about during the interview. And that supplemental app, those meaningful experiences kind of did that work for me. And actually what I ended up doing when I'm taking my notes before each interview is I would star, because I would go through and write things a person had done, but I would put a star next to the ones that were listed in there. And I would also star something if it was also repeated in the personal statement. So that kind of helped guide my interview discussion. Um, so for that reason, and I feel like I'm very much in the minority on this, talking to other program directors, but for that reason, I found it, it really useful. Yeah, I think that's, I think that is really interesting. It's interesting how we disagree on our approaches to that, but also I was thinking back to your comment about regional signals. Like, I think as a Californian who trained uh, on the West Coast, the East Coast, and now lives in the Midwest, I have really felt like if a candidate wants to come to our program, they're going to come here regardless. Um, and so I have I have not put much stock in region before. Like I've said, we look at pretty much everyone the same. Um, and I think that might also be a, reflect a difference in our programs. Like it takes a certain person to want to live in Manhattan, right? Like I love Manhattan. I don't want to live there. Uh, I think that um, I, I wonder if Midwest uh, has a little bit more of the accessible appeal in that sense. Um, but maybe, maybe I'm also completely um, uh, fooling myself. Oh, you might be because, you know, full disclosure, I was a faculty member at Ohio State University for two years. And just so you know, my wife dragged me kicking and screaming to that city, which, <laughs> by the way, to be fair, upon my arrival was blissful. And I might not have been happier any other two years of my life. Um, but having not been an Ohioan, um, I was not super excited. A lovely city would right. go back in a heartbeat. Um so that's interesting. So what about pass fail step one, which by the way, oh, was yeah. fully implemented. Right. So, you know, I want this to was the last class that kind of straddled, right? Like I, I, I actually was going to run the data on my own ARS applicants and I haven't done it yet, but to see who had a, a three digit score and who just had a pass fail. Um, Cause I'm curious what the breakdown was. My guess just like, back of the napkin is it would seemed like it was probably close to 70 or 80% pass fail and 20 to 30% had three digit scores. Do you think that was like, how yours looked? Oh, you know what? I think we look at different applicants. You know what I'm going right. to do? I actually have a quick list. I'm when you said 70, I'm like, oh, 70 is exactly what I thought. I thought you in were the other direction. 70% in the other direction. Interesting. Because I think that I had about 70, 80, and um, no one can see this, but I'm just pulling up a quick list so I can be honest. I feel like the really the majority had gotten a score on their step one. Um, I have a way of oh. For me, honestly, Dave, it could be 85, 90% for me. Wow. How had, step, had, a, had a three digit score. Had a three digit score. That's super interesting. Um, um, so, how did that play? How did, how did pass fail play into how you looked at applicants? So, you know, to be honest, I really 
one of the things I'm worried about with the with the switch to pass fail, um, and what I'm about to say is probably the opposite of what people anticipate. Uh, I've traditionally tried to find what I consider significant markers of what's going to make a great resident. And I, I've never been convinced that um, other than being assured that you're going to be able to pass exams, that that score um, correlates very well with how someone's going to do in residency. And by how someone's going to do in residency, I mean that like, you're going to be a good colleague. Are people going to like coming to work and teaching you and working with you? And so I've looked for other markers. I think things like clinical grades can be useful. Um, it depends uh, on how the school reports them. I love those medical schools that actually break down the clinical grades. So this person overall got high pass. But just so you know, for their clinical performance, they got honors. And for their presentation, they got honors. And for their shelf, they got pass. And so they got high pass. And that tells me a lot. I'd much rather have the person who got all honors clinical grades, but ended up with a much lower overall ratio of uh, uh, honors to high pass or pass than the person who actually got passed for all their clinical performances, but 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 squeaked it out with the shelf exam. Uh, I'm almost afraid other program directors are going to start reading the applications like I do and snatch up those people. Steal all your good candidates? Yeah. yeah, steal all those people who are, you know, just being looked over. I love people who are overlooked. Um, what did Trump say? I love my low education voters. I love, <laughs> I love my like, uh, my applicants who are not getting, who are low visibility for, for something that has to do with the way that people traditionally evaluate them, but they really have a lot to offer. I like to be the one who can find that and get that great applicant. Um, but I'm not too scared about it because I believe that next year when all of the step one scores are pass fail, a lot of my colleagues will basically use step two to replace step one as a, as a screening criteria. What do you think? I I do think that is happening. Uh, by the way, I just looked at my ARIS data, and I think I'm I think I'm where you are. I think ninety percent of them had three digit scores. Yeah. I think I was mentally thinking that they didn't. Um, but uh, I will say that we re we really, in anticipation of this, we went away from board scores as a cutoff um, years ago, and it was it was hard for the first year. It was harder for people who who you know were on the interview committee who especially have been doing it for a long time and relying on that. It, it has not felt hard since then. Like I, I would encourage. I think based on all the data we have about the poor performance of of US MLE scores at predicting anything of value to the specialty of anesthesiology, other than maybe how likely you are to pass your boards on your first try, I I hope that we can uh, uh, move away from from step one and step two, and uh, and I think that they will continue to be hurdles for from students to pass, but hopefully we can value all the other things that you mentioned uh, in, in trying to find really great candidates for the for the specialty. Yeah, I got to say, what's that ABBA song, Take a Chance on Me? I took a yeah. chance on a couple of people <laughs> and uh, they really stepped up. I mean, I've had people that were just such wonderful human beings um, and I had other things in their application that made me really interested to meet them. People who may have had a, abysmal step one scores, I can think of multiple residents over the past eight years I've been doing this who came back and scored in the top quartile in the country on their third year ITE had no yeah. problem passing the boards and had step one scores that prevented them from getting a lot of um, interviews. So uh, maybe we'll encourage more program directors to look more deeply. But at the same time, medical students, medical schools rather, seem to be making these dean's letters more and more opaque. So it's, it's, it's an arms race at the same time. It is. It is. And I hope if you are a, a, a learner on the listening end of this, I hope you feel like if you have a step one score, or step, even a step two score that you're not happy about, please do not let that be the barrier to, to you in the future of anesthesiology. I think um, I think you uh, can hear from both of us and from a lot of program directors that that is, that is not a predictive of how good of an anesthesiologist you're going to be. Brian, I remember when we went to virtual interviews, you and I were on the phone pulling our own hair out about the idea of having to do virtual interviews forever. I think we're in the world where we're going to do virtual interviews forever. Can, what do you I, think? I, I, want to, I want to do a little meta talk here. Just so you guys know, um, we try to be prepared. Um, you know, we try to be responsible people. And we actually have an outline for what we want to talk about. And and Dave is transitioning beautifully. I'm like listening to you. I'm like, oh, my God, another great transition. So we are transitioning to talk about. I mean, so I almost ruined your transition by talking about. <laughs> transition, but I'm just so impressed. We need to be transparent as educators. I like it. Um, so, you know what? I I, I shared your point of view, and I, I kind of want to get a little spicy here with how we talk about this. And um, we're going to have the SCA 
uh, board review this before it can even be posted. So if it's not spicy, the, some of the things we're going to say, they told us to edit out. Um, I felt as though last week, uh, the future of interviews will be virtual. Um, but I wanted to do some research. So I actually pulled up the AAMC guidance about interviews um, for this cycle that we just completed. And I was reading some of their wording, and um, you guys can go, if you just Google AAMC interview guidance for the 2022-2023 residency cycle, you can find all this information and some of what I'm going to read to you right now. And if you look at the conclusion before the recommendations, they say in the short term, so in the short term is all, already a little bit hopeful, the AAMC recommends continuing the virtual interview experience experiment it's an experiment right that was yeah. necessary for the last two cycles they they note that there are costs and time savings to both applicants and programs i think it might be understated how much the costs and time savings to programs in my opinion is playing a role in this decision making um they say that high level data looking at match rates satisfaction measures suggest that the process has been generally successful so there's quite a bit of hedging which makes me makes me happy um, and more study needs to be done to make an informed decision for the long term. And they recommended this year that you know, we should continue virtual interviews. Um, they strongly discouraged hybrid interviewing, which was a strategy I, I strongly um, considered, um, that we should share our interview plans with applicants clearly and early. Um, and um, they also mentioned things about focusing on anti-bias, best anti-bias practices. Um what do you think, Dave, about, I'm going to ask you a question. Why do you think we're still doing virtual interviews? And what about your opinion makes you think that that the future is virtual? It's a great, it's a great question. I, I think what you're hinting at is like, there is, there is institutional pressure to keep things virtual, right? Like it, it is at least 50% of the price to have virtual interviews for our program than it would have been to have in-person interviews. And I think if you are a department chair or a dean or uh, an executive vice president of a health system that you see that as real cost savings and that is a benefit. I'll also say like uh, anecdotally, my wife and I couples matched in residency. We took out a loan to pay for traveling around the country that we paid off not that long ago. Um, and so there is real cost to, to candidates. And I don't want to minimize that because I think it disproportionately falls on candidates who don't can't maybe borrow money from from family or uh, or have other sources of, of previous income. But honestly, I think the the real reason that we're going to stay virtual is just because it's worked OK. And now people are just comfortable in this setting. And I think like, as we saw over the holiday season this year, like travel continues to be a mess and expense and increasingly expensive. And I think people are just like, you know what? It's fine. Uh, I will say that, that uh, my program coordinator could tell you like my, our first year, like I threw a straight tantrum. Like I thought that the reason that we recruited well to Columbus, Ohio, was we got residents here. We paid for their hotel. We took them out to a great part of town um, in, called the Short North, where they'd have dinner with residents and really get to see, even for for a West Coast, East Coast guy like myself, like ah, actually, it's pretty nice here. Uh, and and I think what I've realized is we're able to create and and demonstrate the environment of our place and our program in a virtual setting in a way that I didn't think was possible. And so. Uh, I I feel confident that that we're going to stay virtual for the foreseeable future. What do you think? I agree with you. It works. Um, so from my point of view as a residency program director, it has not negatively impacted my ability to attract and recognize and um, develop a great class. Um, if anything, the two classes that I've been able to recruit with virtual interviews have been amongst my best, if not my best. I'm very happy with the result. Uh, you're speaking about traveling. I have even seen in some of these, um, some of the guidance, um, the um, environmental cost of all of these people flying airplanes. I'm sorry, it strikes me as a little bit insincere and disingenuous. Um, I mean, I agree, it's obviously true, but I don't know if that's really motivating the double AMC. Um, I feel as though we have an obligation though to our learners. Um, you know, these, have, these young people, they've worked so hard. Uh, they've excelled at every stage of their lives. They've worked to get into medical school. They've worked hard in medical school. They've come to the conclusion that they want to embark on what's going to be the most challenging four years of their professional life, most likely. 
until you have kids guys and that's much more challenging by the way um, <laughs> but uh and and then we deny them the possibility and there's cheating going on already because i think a lot of program directors feel the same way i do um just so you know you might say oh i can't interview but then i'll just go and do a second look right second looks have been verboten fairly explicitly by most of the um larger national bodies and gmes there's a lot of cheating going on. And when I say cheating, I almost don't even mean that pejoratively. I understand. I don't hold it against a program director who wants to give an applicant a chance to see the institution. Because a lot of a lot of the applicants, I think the majority of applicants to whom I'm speaking, I don't know how honest they can be with me, have told me that their preference is a chance to visit the program. Um, and I, I don't know how fair it is, uh, the, how fair it is to all of you if you're applying or thinking about applying that you can't visit the program. Um, so I like all the hedging words that I saw in the double AMC. <laughs> I loved the hedging, uh, despite the fact that I'm perfectly fine uh, and I feel like I can get what I want out of it. I think we do have an obligation to these applicants to give them what they want. I also don't want to minimize the um, the arguments that have been made or the rationales about the cost. You know, there's a wide variety. I mean, I went to med school. I came from a working class family. There are people who had a lot more resources, people whose parents were physicians, bankers in my class, who probably wasn't a big deal for them to travel all over the place. I also had to take out a loan. It was a very high interest loan. It was the first one that I paid off. But if I could do it again, it was worth it to me to go to the places. And I, you know, so I, I kind of wish people were able to make that decision for themselves. Can you recall? I remember, you know, we had virtual interviews during COVID. And then the next year, we were figuring out we're going to do virtual interviews again. And I forget the acronym of this organization, and I should be doing my research before a podcast. And everyone's like, we have to wait to hear the statement put out by, do you remember that organization? Yeah, the Committee for Physician Responsibility. Right? Was was that the name of the committee? Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. I Something like that. I, I had never heard the acronym before in my life. Yeah. To be fair, had you? Uh, no. No. So- so all of a sudden, the head of our GME, all these big people are like, we're waiting for the statement by so-and-so. And I'm like, there's a statement by who? I've met by whom? I've never heard of this committee before. And people are acting. Uh, you like, know what it is? It's Coalition for Physician Accountability. That's yes. what it is. It was like, it was like I, I'm, I'm guessing the people were waiting at the, the bottom of Mount Sinai and Moses is going up. We're waiting <laughs> to see what the tablets say. But I mean, there was all of this authority imbued rhetorically in this committee of which I had never heard that even at the moment when we were waiting for this, it struck me as like, there's something weird about this. Like, there's something at play. Um, so I, I've questioned the sincerity of the rationale. I know that medicine is going through a lot of changes right now. Um, the cost of healthcare in the setting of COVID with staffing issues, hospitals are facing massive financial problems. You know, I, I think there's a financial incentive on both sides. And I think the financial incentive by the um, the hospitals that are doing a lot of the hosting, this is where I wanted to get spicy, might be underplayed. Um, I just really, really hope we're doing justice to the people applying. I wish we could get like a survey. I haven't seen survey data. I, know, I think the, the challenge is it's, there's such a power dynamic, right? So you can I can ask the candidates, like, do you feel like, do you want a second look? Do you, and I always wonder, like, am I am I pressuring them? Am I, am I getting the accurate, you know? So I guess what I would encourage candidates and future candidates is like, please ask for what, what you think you need to help make an informed decision. Because we, program directors want very desperately to advocate for you and to get you the information that you need to make an informed decision. I think that is really important to us. We don't want, uh, we don't want somebody in our program who's not gonna be happy in our program. We don't want, uh, we don't want that. I, that doesn't do anything for either of us. Um, and and we want to help you guys make the decision. And it's, it is affordable and a reasonable way as possible, I think, Brian hit the nail on the head. You guys have worked very hard to deserve to go to train at a place that you're going to be happy in. And that's something that we really want to help facilitate. Well, I hope that was a little bit spicy, but still stays in the uh, the episode. Just so you know, we do think this is a dialogue and we want to hear from you. I say something like survey. I would love to see a survey of all the people who just matched and to hear if they are happy with the process and would have preferred the opportunity to visit. We're actually going to give you an opportunity to share with us. If if you have an opinion and you want to share it, you can send us a video. Maybe we'll even post the video. Uh, 
our email address is pds at c. So p-d-s-a-t-s-e-a at s-e-a-h-q dot org. pds at c at c-h-q dot org. Uh, we actually want to create a lot of content based on the feedback we get from you. Um, again, share a little video if it's short and snappy and high enough quality. Maybe we'll post it here. Um, but we want this to be a real dialogue. So do you think we've done a, a good job of talking about the last season at this point, Dr. Stahl? I think so. Well, maybe we should get someone else's point of view. Um, I want to share the interview uh, I had. I haven't had it yet, but when you hear this, I will have had it with uh, Dr. Carol Dyer. Be transparency. Yeah, we love to be transparent. Um, who is the uh, Society for Education Anesthesia president-elect and the now former program director at UF Jacksonville um, and a really great person. So uh, drum roll, here's my interview with Carol Dyson. And can you introduce yourself, Carol, to our listeners? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for having me on the initial podcast. Uh, I'm Carol Dietchen. I am the newly recovering program director uh, at the University of Florida, Jacksonville. Um, I am now the associate dean for educational affairs here. I am also the vice president and president-elect of the Society for Education and Anesthesia. So thank you so much for having me. With those roles, you're extremely well positioned to be talking on this show with us. And I really appreciate you coming. So just briefly, can you tell me a little bit about how much time you spent in the role of program director? And just so the people listening to this know where you're coming from, just some details about the location, um, context, and structure of your residency program. Absolutely. Um, so before I came to Florida, I was the associate program director at the University of Rochester for a long time, <laughs> um, and then came to the University of Florida in 2014 uh, to take over as program director. So I've had a fairly long stint as a program director um, here at the University of Florida in Jacksonville, and our program is a small program. So it's only four per year. During my stint, we actually change the program from being an advanced program to being a categorical program. So I've had experience in managing both types of programs where you actually get your interns right from the beginning and when you don't. Well, it's really important for listeners to realize there are so many different types of anesthesiology residency training programs. When you hear from a program director, our opinions are very much shaped by our experience. I'm at currently a mid-sized to larger program, so I'm sure that the considerations and concerns and ideas about education I have are very different from yours, Carol. So we are being hosted by the Society for Education and Anesthesiology. Many people are probably watching us on the website. Uh, I love being an SCA member, and as the president-elect, would love to hear from you about your experience in the SCA, why you've stayed with the SCA, and what value you think the SCA brings to not just future educators, but future anesthesiologists in general. The Society for Education and Anesthesia, I will freely admit, has basically made my career. Um, I joined uh, the C a really long time ago now. Um, in the early 2000s. Um, and it really introduced me to a community. And I really think that's actually one of the most important parts of the Society for Education and Anesthesia is we are a very inclusive community. We have all and invite all anesthesia educators uh, to be part of our group. And we are very welcoming and really like to share ideas and thoughts. Um, we do a lot of collaboration across different groups from various program directors to clerkship directors. Um, we are very welcoming in all of our committee work um, and everyone gets an opportunity to really have a voice. Over the years, I have done a number of different things in the C. Um, I initially started out working in the faculty development committee um, and helped to work on starting up the uh, faculty portal on the website. 
um, and have remained part of the group as a peer coach, which I think is one of the great programs that C offers um, to a lot of our faculty to actually provide that kind of feedback that can be really useful to improve you as a teacher, but also as something to use as far as your promotions process. Um, but in addition, we've also done a lot of different innovative things um, from uh, a lot of research opportunities in medical education to many different types of meetings. I worked on the meetings committee for many years before joining the board of directors. Um, I was most recently the secretary of the society and now as the vice president. That's awesome. Well, let's say I am maybe a junior faculty member who's really looking to expand my skill set as an educator, or maybe even a resident. I'm like a future chief resident. Are there any resources uh, that SCA could offer that would provide a lot of practical utility for me achieving my goals? We have a wide variety of resources. Um, from the resident perspective, one of the things we have at our spring meeting um, is actually our chief resident um, workshop, which is incredible resource for a lot of our chief residents to actually network um, and learn a lot of great skills, um, particularly leadership skills, conflict management, those types of things. Uh, but in addition, we also have a new and up and coming um, educational research initiative that's actually being started by our research committee uh, to help stimulate um, educational research by even residents. Um, for junior faculty, there's a lot of different resources available. Um, the entire faculty development uh, website of our overall C website has many, many resources about uh, planning your career as a clinician educator, uh, promotion and tenure information. Um, and that group actually sponsors a lot of workshops specifically on those topics. Uh, we have our um, teaching workshop that is held every January here down in Florida, it's where the weather is nice. Um, that is incredible. I went to it many years ago, um, and it really gave me the start of the my foundation in education knowledge. Um, and the other thing that I think is incredible is the networking opportunities. By coming to the meetings and interacting with other clinician educators, you then make relationships with them. And these are great mentoring opportunities. Uh, and that can be incredibly helpful for any junior faculty when say they're gonna go up for promotion and they need letters of support that are external to their own institution. C is a phenomenal place to get those letters. Well, I can definitely echo that. I recall when I was being put up for associate professor my chair, Meg Rosenblatt, said, oh, you're going to need all these letters from external people. Don't worry. I have people I can call in favors. And I said to her, uh, actually, not to be too bold, but I don't think I'll have a problem. I knew I needed this, and I drafted 20 names of people I met primarily through C, um, who were very eager to write me letters. And you're right. The mentorship I've received has been amazing. The inclusivity of C is what keeps me coming back. Um, you know, you see a lot of people looking to advance their career. And obviously societies are a great place to do that, but sometimes that can lead to a lot of jockeying exclusivity, something I've never experienced and see. I've only found a very open mentoring, welcoming um, relationship with everyone there. So thank you for telling us about C. Since I have you here and you have a lot of time as both an associate and program director, by the way, I started my job in 2014 and to see you moving on, I'm starting to feel pretty old in the job. Um, <laughs> it's not just the eight years of hard work as a program director. Recovering is definitely a good word, but um, I'm still struggling with my addiction. <laughs> um, anyway, it's been a very exciting year with the uh, with the applications and a lot of big changes. Uh, so Dave and I spoke about this uh, earlier, but I would love to hear your take coming from a much smaller program about the impact of things such as the signals, the pass fail, step one in the ongoing virtual format. So let's, let's start with the signals. What was your experience of the use or the opportunity for applicants to use these five signals they had this year? Honestly, I really liked having the program signals. Um, 
with the caveat that we specifically instructed our own medical students, as well as any of medical students who actually did away rotations with us, not to use their program signals for our own program, because we didn't have any specific rules across the uh, specialty on that. And so we actually gave our group that instruction. But what it did is it actually really gave us an additional group of people that we actually would look at their application that would not have otherwise made my filters. Um, so we have four spots per year and we had about a hundred people actually signal our program. And of that group, approximately 35 to 40 would not have made my filters otherwise. Um, and so I wouldn't necessarily have even opened up their application to do kind of that big holistic review had they not actually signaled our program. And they were amazing people. The problem is we have so many applications, right? And so we just can't read through absolutely everything. And so we're trying our best to, to figure out where to really start. And this actually, I think, really helped us to know where to start. Do you think the signals impacted the quantity of applications you received? Because I've been hearing from program directors that they saw a change in the trend they were seeing in quantity. So some programs had an increase every year and this year had a decrease. Many programs had a massive increase this year. What did you guys experience? So we had a similar number of applications over the past couple years to our program. So I didn't really notice a huge difference uh, in the total number of applications that we had. I will say it's just amazing what all of these applicants are doing, right? I mean, it's so incredible, all of the different research and community work and so forth that, that it makes it really, really challenging to actually really kind of differentiate between everybody. Um, I think that the signals offer an opportunity in particular for students who may be on the edge of some of those other things that we look at when we're trying to determine who it is that we're really going to do that very in-depth, holistic review on. Um, it'll get them noticed by a particular program because if somebody signals me, they really want, are, are really considering coming to me, right? If otherwise they wouldn't have bothered to, to use one of their five signals. So there are talk um, about maybe expanding the signal system, a tiered signal system going from somewhere from now five to 15 or even 20 with five being a higher tier signal. What are your opinions based on your experience of what would best work for, let me say, a specifically a smaller program like yours? I think having more signals would be very, very useful if it helped to reduce the total number of applications that everyone is sending out. And what do I mean by that? Well, right now, when you're getting... 1,400 to 1,600 applications for four spots, I'm not reading all of those, right? It would be incredibly helpful if across the board, we all decided as program directors, we're going to read and open up all of the applications of people that signal us. We're not going to look at the other ones. Maybe that would actually serve as a way of encouraging students not to apply to every program that's out there and really emphasize applying to the programs that they realistically can get into or that they have a true actual interest in. But having said that, I think it's also important that they have accurate information about how to make that decision. And right now, there really isn't great information out there. I mean, I would advocate for a real database of all of the information that we obtain off of ERAS applications of the people that actually matched with us over the last three to five years so that students and other educators who advise them would have real good information about where this student would actually fall in relationship to some of those programs. That's a great point. I saw a wide variety in approaches or strategies for the signals. 
Some of them really shocked me. Um, I actually reached out to a, a program director at an institution with a medical school affiliated and asked, who is, who is mentoring your students? Mm-hmm. Because they made signal decisions here that don't make sense to me. And it's giving me mixed signals. I think that's a great point. Well, you said many of these people did not necessarily uh, reach what would what would previously have been your filters or your ways of selecting people to do a deep dive in their application. Well, at the same time this year, uh, many applicants submitted a pass fail mm-hmm. score for step one. What do you think of that? And maybe even in light of the signal system, how do you think that will impact your approach looking at applications? So we had a mix of people that had step one scores this year or complex level one scores. Um, Cause we actually look DO, MD and we don't really differentiate between necessarily the scores. Um, I think that it was more of a challenge uh, in actually looking at kind of the opportunities uh, for our students because The reality is that the passing score on say the step one exam does not track with reliably passing our board exams in anesthesia. It's, it it just doesn't, it's not high enough. Um, And so I think unfortunately the result of that is gonna be a much, much higher emphasis on what that step two or that level two score is. And that could make or break a student if they have a bad day on this one single exam. Whereas in the past, when we had two scores, you might be able to say, oh, well, you know, their step one score isn't the best, but wow, they did great on step two or vice versa, right? And they had at least two different potential opportunities. I think honestly, while the whole idea behind doing this was to actually you know, improve our inclusivity of all of our various students and giving everybody a lot broader perspective of us looking at other things. The problem is when you have too many applications, you just can't do that. And so now, unfortunately, I think this is actually going to end up hurting students, particularly in really highly competitive specialties like ours is. I I could definitely see that in your right. Uh, one of my biggest fears, like you said, it's not super predictive of success in board pass rate, yet it gives us something objective. I believe we want to feel like we're being objective. If we're not being objective, we're not being fair somehow. Um, I've always done a deep dive into a lot of applications to seek those diamonds in the rough. Uh, I was saying earlier, I think that this this scares me. Are, are more people going to be looking closely at the comments on the clinical rotation <laughs> grades? Because there's gold in them hills. And um I'm afraid that my strategy, which has helped me find really great candidates, will be more broadly used, but that's actually maybe a good thing. So I think it remains to be seen. You're probably right. It's probably just going to be step two. And finally, we're still virtual. I think years ago, many of us thought we'd be virtual for a year and then, oh my gosh, this pandemic is long, maybe just two. Now, it seems like virtual might be the new norm. What are your feelings on that? I think virtual is here to stay. Um, at least when it comes to the initial interviews. And that's really an equity issue. Um, It is incredibly expensive for this entire application process. But then to add on top of that, the cost of traveling to every one of these programs with the expectation that if you don't show up, you know, they're not going to like consider you from the student perspective. Um, I, I think that puts certain people at a significant disadvantage uh, in with battling what those costs are. Um, So I think that that aspect is here to stay. I would love to have an opportunity to allow students to do a live second look at a program, but I don't think offering it before any of us submits our rank list changes that dynamic at all, right? If you are offering a live second look and the student knows that you have not necessarily submitted your rank list, even if you tell them that you have, they're not going to believe it. They're going to feel obligated that they have to show up if they want a chance of actually matching at your program. So again, it's an economic issue. Do they have to show up? I would advocate 
to push the NRMP to push up the dates of our rank lists. If everybody had to submit their rank list, say mid-January, that would give the students a good six weeks to potentially travel to places they really care about going to, that they really want to be able to make their decision, and they know it's going to have nothing to do with how they're actually ranked at that program, then they don't necessarily feel obligated to travel to every place, but it gives them the opportunity to at least come visit, check out the place, check out the area, and really get a better feel for how they think they might fit in. That's a great idea. So currently, um, I believe we submit our rank lists due the same day the applicant's rank list is due. Yes. I've heard of the idea of GMEs insisting that programs have a certified rank list submitted before any second looks. But what you're saying is a great idea nationally. Mm -hmm. our, our rank list can be due six weeks in advance of the applicants. I, I think that's a great idea. And that can kind of thread that needle of the argument for you know equity in addition to giving people a chance to see the place they're going to be spending the four most challenging years of their life at the same time. Well, great ideas. This kind of conversation is exactly why we wanted to have this podcast to, to have more conversation between educators, get great ideas out there that maybe are percolating. That's the first time I've heard of this, this tiered um, system for having second looks. And I think it's a great one. Um, any words of advice as we embark on this podcast journey? Oh, wow. Um, I think that having an opportunity to share some of the practical things out there about running programs or running clerkships and so forth is incredibly helpful to so many program directors. We've had live sessions in workshops at C, uh, what we call the program director roundtable, where program directors got together. There was no set agenda. We just had an opportunity to share ideas and share thoughts. And this is essentially a virtual version of that. It allows us to share ideas and collaborate and even after just hearing about something over a podcast or, or a video that's on, on a website. I think this is an amazing opportunity. I am so glad that you are embarking on this. It's a wonderful resource for the C. Thank you. You said share. I would say we commiserate quite a bit when we get together um, because it's a, it's a labor of love, but it's a labor nonetheless that can get tough. Well, thank you, Dr. Dietchen, for spending time with us. And we hope to see you back and hope people get to know you through their involvement in C as well. Thank you so much for inviting me, Brian. Dr. Dyeshin, for uh, sharing your point of view, talking about the Society for Education and Anesthesia and some of your insights into the most uh, recent application cycle. Um, so before our next interview, um, I want to talk about some of the future plans. What, what, do you, what do you hope to do with this podcast going forward, Dr. Stahl? You know, I'd like to, to continue to engage in kind of a dialogue of, of, What's in our head as program directors when we're thinking about creating training opportunities in anesthesiology? And I think that um, I'd like to have that be a dialogue, a back and forth, waves of the sea, so to speak, with with our learners and future learners. And, uh, and hopefully, again, to create a connection and engagement so that they may want to be the people that follow us to create educational opportunities in anesthesiology. Um, I love the idea of talking about professional identity formation. I think that is something that is kind of underrepresented in, in anesthesiology. I think uh, talking about mentorship, I think talking importantly about diversity and inclusivity in the field and how we can continue to do better and how uh, the way we approach education uh, can make or break our ability to be diverse and inclusive. Uh, I think Talking about wellness and well-being is uh, is incredibly important. I'll make a quick plug for our former chairman's article in the ASA Monitor um, this past month on uh, on burnout and depression. I think uh, if the president-elect of the Society American Society of Anesthesiologists can talk about his battle with depression, I think that we should be a lot more open about the mental health challenges uh, that exist in the field. Um, and then uh, I think Brian, you wanted to talk about the interview dark web. Oh, so you, so maybe some future episodes we want to do. Um, you know, you guys might not realize this, but uh, program directors can also access a lot of the resources that you use online. 
no, f- for my own mental stability, I avoid them at all costs. And it's not so much that I don't want to see what's being said about my program. It's generally pretty good. So I'm happy to see it. Um, it's just one thing that I've learned, and I actually tell the the medical students in Mount Sinai or the rotating students when they're talking about the application cycle, uh, I'm like, you, ha- you guys have no idea what you're doing. Um, and I'm doing my best to try to guide you. Um, you know, everyone has their own priorities. But when I hear things early on in interview season or read things on uh, these message boards, I think you guys just have no idea what you're doing. I, I want to save you. I want to get out there and like prevent you from making really bad decisions with really bad points of view. And not because you don't have a good point of view in general, but just very, very little experience. Um, Do you feel old when you look at like, the Reddit or the Discord or the or the Google Doc and realize that like our version of that was like studentdoctor.net or some other like weird email chain that would go around where you thought you were getting real deal information where really it was probably we were we were all just as blind going through the process. It's just sure. in higher fidelity now than it was back then. Well, what we one idea we have is we're going to go through and just pick out some themes and uh, allow you guys to bounce those themes that are kind of recurrent in there off of program directors to get program director reactions obviously can't read any direct quotes but just to get themes and say the kids these days are saying what do you think of this uh, actual program directors um you know one of the things that i want to do there are so many resources out there uh, for anesthesiology education if you want to learn about anesthesiology if you want to learn the topics important for the practice of anesthesiology there's so much out there um, and I don't really think that I can play much of a role and bring a lot of value to adding to that. Uh, uh, what we really want to do is, is take a step back and talk about the really big picture issues that impact education and anesthesia um, and, and try to bring in like the political impacts, the economic influences, the social trends impacting anesthesiology and education, um, have some high level discussions that might be actually fun for almost anyone to listen to, even if they're outside of anesthesiology, because it's a little bit more broad-minded. Uh, that's where my mind tends to go and what I enjoy talking about. So we hope to hear your feedback, guide our conversation. You know, if you meet me at a party and you want to get a discussion running, ask me about how I handle vacation scheduling for my residents. I, I can talk for hours. I mean, I just have this, this passion, this love for all of like the boring intricacies of running a residency program. Hey, Brian, what do you think about guiding residents to do a fellowship or to go straight out to get a Oh my God, I can talk for hours. But I, I think this is important. And I really hope that there's a lot of value in other program directors, people starting out, people hoping to be program directors as educators in general. And applicants to anesthesiology residents hearing from a couple of program directors who I think we really care uh, about this and, and care about our learners. Uh, do you have a treat for our listeners here, Dr. Stahl, that you want to introduce? I do. I want to introduce uh, my conversation. Transparently has not happened yet uh, with the uh with the director of the ACRAC podcast, uh, Jed Wolpaw, who is also the program director at Johns Hopkins. Uh, fun fact, Jed and I were medical students together back at UCSF, what seems about a thousand years ago. Um, and uh, I'm excited to talk to him a little bit about, about podcasting, uh, as well as about uh, the interview season and what he sees as the future of the interview season for, for our residency programs. Well, if you guys attended medical school together, then I fully expect that you will do what a best man usually does in the best man speech and and use that as a chance to share like embarrassing anecdotes about the person back in the day. If you don't come back with that, I think everyone here will be a little bit disappointed. Um, So we look forward to that. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I am here with Jed Wolpaw. Jed and I actually go back uh, to medical school, school time at, uh, at UCSF. Jed, as many of you know, is the residency program director at Hopkins. He is an associate professor of anesthesiology and intensivist uh, and the founder and uh, host of the podcast ACRAC. And we are here uh, today to talk about education and anesthesia. So let me start out just by asking you, you know, we're, we're coming up on match day. What are your takeaways from this interview and recruitment season? Well, thanks, Dave. Great to see you again. And thanks for having me on this show. Um, Yeah, I think it's a really interesting season, unique in many ways. This is, as many people will know, the first season where we've had signals in anesthesiology. Some specialties, as you know, had it last year. 
that was the first time they were ever used, but not in anesthesiology. So for us, this was the first time applicants had the ability for those who don't know to send up to five signals to programs. Basically, so this was before interviews. So this was basically saying you're one of my top five programs right off the bat. And then uh, programs could see those and decide what they want to do with them. Some programs, I'm sure, did nothing with them. Some used them pretty extensively to try to decide who to offer interviews to and probably everywhere in between. So that made this a unique and interesting interview season. Um, there were other pieces to that a supplemental application that included the signal. So applicants could also signal certain geographic regions. They could also list some kind of top uh, activities that they did and explain why they they did them. And then they could also say if they felt they had had particular um, challenges or hardships uh, along the way uh, to becoming a medical student, they could explain that if they wanted to. And so it was, uh, I thought, a definite plus. It was a, an addition that was very helpful to us to have that stuff uh, compared to having to not having it. Probably not totally sufficient. I think we need more than five signals, and uh, we will very likely be having 15 next year in a little bit of a tiered way, but more, more to come on that. I'm happy to talk about that. But I think that um, what this allowed us to do, uh, and for listeners, they'll probably know, program directors really struggle. We get 1,500, 2,000, whatever it is, applications, and we can't possibly read through all of those in detail and, and do a holistic review of, of 2,000 applications. And so often what happens is we do a not holistic review. We do a very, very <laughs> quick review of those. What this signaling allows us to do, hopefully, is to say, I can do a much more thorough review of the people who signaled my program because they're much more likely given the pretest probability that they said up front, I was one of their top five programs, they probably want to come here. There's a good chance that they will will want to be here. And so we want to look really closely at them. And this is compared to, for example, someone else who may have applied to 70 programs, and we might be their 69th choice. Well, it's really unlikely that they're going to decide to come, that they're going to rank us anywhere near a matching level. And so we don't want to spend a huge amount of time that we could be spending on a different application on there. So that was the advantage. I think it, it did work for that. And uh, and that made this season pretty interesting. Of course, we won't know for another, uh, let's see, about 11 days how it worked and whether people matched better, whether people the match rate was better or worse or the same, whether people are happy with the places they match, whether programs are happy with, with the um, way that the match went for them. We'll find all that out. And it'll be really interesting. Yeah, I think... I took away from it very similar things. I'm really excited to see some of the data, and we're expecting that that the AMC and uh, NRMP will put out some of that data about you know how did the signals work in the field, and we've seen that from other specialties. So I'm excited to see that data. I also think uh, it's worth recognizing that that we as program directors had the level of anxiety that you all had as applicants, and we appreciate that you were the most experimental. I think. Eras, the supplemental application and signals are all going to go better next year for what you all went through, but but none of us really knew how to handle it, how to handle it this year. So I guess, what are your predictions for next year? You know, what do you think the, the kind of scenes are going to look like? Yeah, and and I'll just echo what you just said that this was a very significant uh, change for everybody, and so you know, I think exactly what you said. We we didn't really know exactly how it was going to go, and it was hard to advise applicants. And I think that was one of the things we really want to correct for next year. And by we, I mean the Program Director Association and Program Directors on the whole is trying to give some, some real specific guidance to applicants of how to use those signals, at least to the extent we can. There's always going to be a certain amount of, you're going to have to decide what to do with your own signals, just as there was with, you're going to have to decide how many programs to apply to and where to apply. Um, and so I, I think of this really as just a different level to that, is that in addition to deciding how many programs to apply to and where to apply, you're going to have to also decide who to signal. I think that um, some of, well, well, we'll find out if it was a mistake. I think that probably there were some applicants who used their five signals inappropriately. And what I mean by that is they signaled like five shoot for the star programs that they were unlikely to get an interview at, even with a signal, in which case you could say they wasted those signals. Um and perhaps some who the on the other end who use them only for what you might consider safety programs for them, uh, and didn't signal some more um, uh, some more uh, challenging to get into programs that they might have actually gotten an interview at if they had sent a signal. And so you had people on both ends. And I think for next year, 
what we'll have is a couple of changes. One, we'll have more signals and that'll help. And, and you know, again, we can talk more about this, but I think we'll have five gold and, and 10 silver. And so pe applicants can still say, okay, you're my top five, but then they can also say to another 10, you know, you're really high on my initial list. And that will, I think, both give programs kind of a two-tiered approach. They can look through really carefully their gold signals and then do a second kind of look through pretty carefully of their silver signals. And then maybe they don't have to go beyond that. There are pros and cons to that. I think it means that if you're an applicant next year, if you send a gold or silver signal, you're likely to get your application really carefully reviewed. However, if you don't signal a program at all, you're really unlikely to get an interview there, even more so than this year, because because they'll know you're not even in their top fifteen. They're not even in your top fifteen, and so I think that's you know good, and that it'll it'll really get you a good review and a good chance of getting interviews at fifteen places, especially those top five. But it will also mean that you may not get many beyond that. So that'll be a change. I also think that the ability to use those or the strategy for using those signals will need to be well thought out probably better than it was last year. I don't know yet what we as a program director association will kind of land on for best advice. There's some things we'll have to think about as in, you know, are we going to suggest that programs require their applicants from their own school to signal them? Are we going to ask people who did away rotations at places that they should signal those places? And then beyond that, you know, again, how do you use them? My personal, if I were a student applying this coming year, I think I would probably look really hard and talk really closely with my advisors about how competitive my application is. And that, you know, again, if you have all honors, if, assuming your school still gives honors and you got a 260 on step one, if you have a score, or if you didn't have a score on step one, you got a 260 on step two, and you've got an MD PhD and you've published, you know, 10 first author publications, well, you probably can apply to one place, right? And and certainly you could assume you'll get, you can shoot, you can give those five signals to the top five programs in the country, however you define that, and almost definitely get interviews at all five of those places, plus the additional 10 you send silvers to, and then you'll just have your pick. On the other hand, if you're a more, you know, middle of the road applicant, let's just say you have like a 235 on step two or 240 or something like that, and your school doesn't give honors. And you've got, you know, some, maybe you've got your name is on a paper, but it's a middle author publication. And you've got a couple of posters in addition to that. And you've got good letters and you've maybe got some honors in your, in your sub eyes. You know, that I would say is a perfectly reasonable application, but it's not, you know, the top, top application. And so for that person, I think you'd have to talk to your advisors and think maybe you're going to send two or three of your gold signals to kind of aspirational programs and another two or three to more reasonable, maybe uh, locally, uh, regionally located programs. And then your silvers, again, it's really nice to have those because I think then you're going to spread those out. Again, maybe you, you put 30% of those to really aspirational programs. You put, you know, maybe 50% to uh, kind of more middle of the road, reasonable pro programs for you. And then you put your 20% your towards some safety, you know, um, schools that you feel like you'll have a really good shot at getting into. So that would be how I think I would approach it. But again, I think every there's not going to be one, like everyone must do this, right? Because different advisors are going to say different things and different people will look at different applicants and say how competitive they are. But the best advice I can give applicants for next year is don't do this alone. <laughs> Talk yes. to more than one person, right? Talk to your, if you only have one advisor, you should have more mentor or advisor talk to people in anesthesiology, talk to people who have been involved in program leadership and say, here's my, here's all my stuff, my scores, my grades, here's what I got. What do you think? How should I use these? How competitive am I? And hopefully people will be honest with you and tell you whether you're, you know, incredibly competitive, kind of, you know, reasonably middle of the road competitive, or whether you're going to struggle even to match in anesthesia. That can be hard to hear, but you want to know it so you can target those things as best you can. That's great. Yeah. I, I would echo that advice. Like, as talk, get lots of advice, like get, get, get lots of different perspectives. All of us are figuring this out as we go and we want to help you, but I think you're the, the closest way to get to the truth is by hearing lots of different opinions. And All I'll right, just, oh, go ahead. yeah, sorry, Dave. I just wanted to say, you know, when it comes to signaling your own home program and or places you did uh, away rotations, hopefully we'll have some guidance coming from the program director association. But regardless of that, you have to talk to those programs because we as a program director association do not have the authority to mandate that programs do any one thing. So we might suggest, look, we suggest that that places should not make their own students signal them. Let's, I don't know, but let's just say that's what we suggest. 
And there might be a school that says, no, no, we we want signals. If you want to come here, even if you're our, our own student, we want a signal, in which case you need to signal them, right? So you have to do right. what they want, not, not what we say. So I would say, make sure you talk to the coordinator or program director at any given program and say, look, I did an away rotation there. I'm very interested in your program. Should I send you a signal or not? And same with your home program. You know, I, I'm here. Of course, I'm interested in this program. Would Do I need to send a signal or not? And then you're going to have to ask also, does it matter if it's gold or silver? And they may say, well, you decide, right? In which case you're going to have to decide. It makes it a little tricky, but that is important to know. Yeah. Uh, all right, rapid fire. Uh, are we staying virtual or you think we'll ever go back to in-person interviews? My guess is that the overall recommendation is going to be to stay virtual for equity reasons, but I think we're going to see more and more, I don't think ever a lot, but more and more programs are going to start bucking that, I think. We already saw that this this year where some programs did in-person interviews despite the recommendation not to. I think we'll see that spread a little more. My guess is it'll never be a huge number of programs again, but we'll see some programs doing it. Geographic signals. So candidates could pick a, they could pick a region, in which case we would see if they picked our region. They could pick no preference, in which case we'd see that they picked no preference, or they could not pick our region and we would just have a blank space knowing that they probably picked some other region, but not knowing what that region was. Matters, doesn't really matter. I don't love the geographic signals. And the reason is that they are often huge regions. Our region, for example, goes from Maryland down through Florida. So right. you signal the, I forget what they called it, maybe the mid-Atlantic region. And that could as easily mean you want to be in Florida as you want to be in Maryland. And those are very different locations in very different places. Um, I, I think that it probably hurt some people because especially the people who said, well, I don't care, right? I, I don't have a preference. Then there, are, there were programs who said, look, we're going to start with our signals. We're going to look at the people who signaled us. And then we're going to look at the people who geographically signaled us. So if you didn't care, then you got hurt because you didn't get in that group of signals. Right. And yet you may have been just as happy to be in that region. So that's why I think sig program signals are a lot better than geographic signals. The, the AMC is not allowing programs to, to or not allowing specialties to get rid of geographic signals this coming year. So they'll be there. Um, and honestly, my best advice to applicants, and I'm interested to hear if you agree or disagree, Dave, but my advice is, don't put no preference. I would pick regions that include your top programs and signal those regions just so you don't accidentally get, you know, get screened out. Though I will say, if you signal a program, I think that's going to trump any kind of geographic signal. So let me just give an example. If you're coming from the East Coast and you send, you know, UCSF a, uh, a, a gold signal or even a silver signal, but you don't signal the California region, I think they're still going to really closely review your application, even though you didn't signal that region, because they know you wouldn't throw a signal away on a on a region you weren't interested in going to. Yeah, and I think the I think the 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 person who might want to consider the no preference is maybe the less strong candidate who is really trying to look anywhere just so you, they don't get that blank box at some program. Like, gosh, they didn't want our region at all, and now they're saying they like us. But again, tough tough advice to give. Uh, what do you think about second looks? Do you think they're going to come back? Yeah, I mean, the I think a lot of programs would like to see the NRMP separate out the rank list deadline for applicants and programs. In other words, programs would have their rank list deadline first, and then maybe several weeks to a month later, applicants would have their rank list deadline. And that would allow programs to have an optional revisit that was truly optional because applicants would know their rank list was in and not changeable. And so they would feel like, okay, I can come if I want, but I don't have to. I know it won't influence the program's ranking of me. Uh, the NRMP, my understanding is that so far has not been willing to do that. Right. In the absence of that, I do think we'll start, despite that, I think we'll start seeing more. We already are. And I think we'll continue to see more in-person revisits. I think the downside is that there are some number of applicants who really can't afford it, but who will break the bank to do it because they will think it it will affect no matter what we say, no matter how many times we say it won't matter, they will think it does because they'll know our rank list isn't finalized. And so they will um, feel like they have to come. And that's why we have not gone back to having an in or haven't started having in-person revisits because we don't want that pressure on applicants. Um, so that's that's what I think. I think we'll start seeing more programs doing it. If the rank list deadline ever gets separated, I think we'll see more um, more places doing it. Um, but it'll be a little tricky because, you know, if you think about it, 
you really can't just tell people like a week before, hey, we're having this revisit in person, buy yourself a plane ticket. And so you'd have to plan it kind of before you might know for sure who you wanted to invite. So the whole thing's a little tricky, but I, I think we will start seeing more of those, but probably a good number of programs will still not do it, especially if the rank list deadline doesn't get separated. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, I think I think exactly, and similar to what you mentioned for in-person interviews, there are programs I think are gonna do it regardless. I think if the NRMP has some sort of way to lock or submit your rank list earlier, we will see more programs do it, mostly because the institutional pressure to not do it will go away um, and kind of that equity argument starts to, to, to diminish, although I don't know that it ever fully goes away. Um, I think that, uh, I think that either way, we're gonna see some more of it and that's how much it, it really is gonna vary. Yeah. So uh, ACRAC was arguably the first uh, impactful anesthesia podcast, if not the first anesthesiology podcast. What advice do you have us uh, for us in thinking about this podcast uh, of how to make an impact and how to do a good job? You know, I think it's uh, it's a fun thing to do. You learn a ton from doing it. And I think my best advice is have fun doing it. Uh, you know, I, I know you guys haven't, but I tell everybody who's thinking about podcasts, you certainly can't go into it with the plan to make money. I think that's a, a losing <laughs> prospect. Um, I think it's going to, you know, no matter what, even if you do at some point start having ads and making some money, it's just going to, it's never going to make up for the time and effort and cost you put into it. So it's going to be, if anything, you know, maybe a break even, probably a money losing if you take your time into account um, project, but that's okay if you enjoy it. So you have to really feel like you, you enjoy it. I think you know, uh, I, my advice is keep it free. I, I wouldn't, I have not, and I, I don't recommend that people make the podcasts, um, put them behind a paywall for the episodes. Um, because I think what's what's been an incredibly rewarding part of this is realizing the reach of it. And I get emails every week from people in countries around the world. I got one from, from a, a trainee in Pakistan the other day. I get them from really, I mean, just every country you can imagine from people who are just so grateful, who listen to the podcast are using it to help them study for whatever their, their anesthesia boards in their country are. And it's, it's really, really rewarding. It, it helps you realize that, you know, we, we, you and I, Dave, you know, we give our lectures to our residents, right. In these elite right. institutions, which is great. And our, we have wonderful residents, but you know, there are so many people trying to learn anesthesiology in countries that need it so badly and they don't have, they don't have that, right? They don't have access to a, a whole stock of professors giving great talks. And so being able to provide stuff like this is really, really rewarding and I think makes a big difference. So, you know, I, I'd say that. Um, and then I think, you know, find a, um, find a style and a, um, you know, and a, a system that works for you in terms of how many you're going to do, who's going to do the interviews, what are you, you going to have multiple hosts or one host? Are you going to have it be scripted or not? Personally, I don't, I, I prefer not to have my guests have a script. If they want one, I, I say that's, you know, obviously up to you, but the vast majority don't. And I like that. I think the conversational style is much more entertaining to listen to and easy to listen to as opposed to something that's really scripted. So I would, I would keep all that in mind and, and then just, you know, be willing as I know you are, but be willing to kind of go with the flow. You may decide to change things up, to switch websites, to switch platforms, to decide to do them more frequently or less frequently, to bring in a, you know, a, a different type of, uh, of interview or a different type of topic. Um, and then have a system for, for getting feedback from your audience, obviously email or, you know, comments on the episodes, but that can be really helpful. A huge number of the topics that I do these days come as requests from audience members. And basically I just keep track. And when I get, you know, 10, 15, 20 people all requesting the same general topic, then I say, okay, I better, I better do a topic on this. So I think having that is a good way to go. Well, it's been really fun. I know my residents have loved, for example, the board review pivot that you've done with ACRAC, and that's been, I think, really impactful and fun. So, and not something you started out with. So you, you never know where these things are going to go. And it's it's great to see to see you doing so well. Uh, I will share a, a brief story from medical school, uh, since I said we knew each other back then. So we both did this thing called Medical Scholars Program, MSP, which is second year medical students teaching first year medical students, kind of after hours, high yield review type topic. And so I remember when uh, I was a second year, Judd was the first year, and uh, we were about to pick teachers for the next year. And one of my co-teachers were like, oh, no, we can't pick that guy. He is a huge gunner. He's going to be like just so hard to manage. And for the millennials in the audience who don't know what gunner is, this is like somebody that your super intense med school classmate, right? And so uh, 
And uh, ultimately, we did pick Jed. He he then crushed it. As many of you know, he's a, a tremendous educator, I think really connects with learners um, and really wants to teach as a passion. Uh, and so it's a good uh, it's a good reminder in the education realm never to judge a proverbial book by its cover. Um, also, it is good uh, to stay in touch with your gunner friends from medical school because they will all go on to do incredible things uh, as Jed has. Uh, so thanks for being here for the interview today. It was a lot of fun. That's awesome, Dave. Thanks. I had forgotten. Um, actually, I don't think I ever knew that story, but I, I hadn't thought about MSP in a while. It was a great program. And um, yeah, I, I definitely was the guy with my hand up all the time in lecture and med school, you know, <laughs> and I just honestly, I I don't think I realized that I was seen as a gunner. I just really was curious. I had all these questions and I wanted to ask them and it didn't occur to me that it was, uh, you know, that asking them all the time uh, was was um, going to get me, <laughs> was going to get me any kind of label, but that's okay. <laughs> I'll take it. Um, but certainly we had a good time and, and med school was a blast and MSP was a blast too. I hope they're still doing it. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, thank you to Dr. Wolpoff for joining us to talk about uh, about the residency, uh, most recent residency season, and uh, and podcasting in in anesthesia education. Um, I'm going to turn things back over to Brian. Thank you. Well, I think we have a, a, some housekeeping we have to do. I think as we go through doing doing more of this, Dr. Stahl, we're going to have a lot of housekeeping we have to take care of. Um, I just want to thank uh, the provider of our audio and our theme song, um, Audio Coffee. Uh, at Pixabay, uh, we're using the song Wake Up to the Renaissance. Um, this was open source, Creative Commons. Thank you for creating this music and sharing with it. Just want to make sure that you get credit. What did you think of our opening theme song, Dr. Stone? Love it. I have to say, I'm I did just research. waiting for you to sing along to it, though. <laughs> I did some research on uh, theme songs because, you know, if you, if you watch television shows, there's nothing you ever watch that doesn't have a theme song to open it. And if you if you take a step back and think about that's kind of odd why can't we just engage with content without a theme song to introduce it uh podcasts tv shows all of them so i did some research and theme songs are used for a number of reasons um one is to get you emotionally engaged and ready for the for the for the um, emotional content of that show so the theme song has to match the feel or the vibe the theme song can also be used uh to introduce important plot points that are relevant for any viewer before engaging with that program. Uh, the best example of that would be the theme song for the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which laid out the entire history bringing the Fresh Prince to Bel-Air. Now I we think you actually, just dated yourself substantially with that well, comment. We started developing lyrics for a song that would like, you know, give the layout, but we decided that neither of us were well prepared to do that. And I have to also say, I kind of want to get a little bit more meta in future episodes about the the format of podcasting and play with that um, for our viewers. But I don't know. What do you think of our first episode, Dr. So I hope we look back one day and say that was terrible. We've gotten so much better at this. Agree. I uh, I did have a fun, fun conversation. It's fun uh, to think about this season. I think it is exciting to think about the future of the field uh, and education in the field of anesthesiology. Uh, and we're excited to continue this dialogue with you all. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, with that, goodbye. Mm -hmm.